Wow. Oh, you remember those days? I do, man. It's crazy to think about how many cloud skeptics we've had over the years. And they were our gurus. Like, those are the leaders that we were supposed to look at, and yet they were telling us this cloud business model would never work, it was kind of upside down, and the technical delivery model was broken. Think back. Where were you 20 years ago? I was just starting a family. I just married Allie. Uh, our son, Bailey, was born. And clearly, you were just starting your modeling career. Well, thanks, Byron, for finding my high school yearbook photo. But luckily, I took some really great advice and split my time evenly between a failed modeling career and the robotics club. Luckily for us in Bessemer, you found your true calling. And it's probably a good jumping off point to actually go to the middle picture here, which is uh, my three co-founders a little over 20 years ago with Trigo Technologies. We were like many of you, looking at starting a cloud business. And the environment was a little different at the time, though. In the entire cloud industry worldwide, there were probably tens of companies. This whole notion of a private cloud unicorn didn't exist. The, the great names you see up here were tiny companies all started within a few months of us. Uh, Salesforce and NetSuite, uh, Intact and PayPal. And so the entire industry itself really took several years to play out. And so let's forward ahead 10 years. Let's look at 2010. At that point in time, you started to see the LinkedIn's and Atlassian's emerge, uh, ServiceNow and Workday, probably hundreds of companies across the cloud ecosystem in total. And for the very first time, a cloud unicorn emerged. This was LinkedIn in the Bessemer portfolio when they raised in 2008 the first private enterprise round at over a billion dollar valuation. The very first time, not only in cloud computing, but in enterprise technology. And then let's roll forward another 10 years. So in 2020, those numbers grew to thousands of private companies, 86 of which became cloud unicorns. So if you think of our Cloud 100 list, which details each year the top 100 private cloud companies, almost that entire list now would be comprised of amazing names like Snowflake and Stripe and HashiCorp and Procore that are all a billion dollar plus private companies, unprecedented in the history of this industry. And we actually use the term exponential here very purposefully. A lot of times in our industry, this term gets thrown around. Uh, and really what people mean is linear growth. Often it's big linear growth and a steep slope, but linear nonetheless. We actually mean exponential this time. And let's think of this and visualize it in a little different way to drive this point home. Let's simplify things down. Let's just look at the top five public cloud companies for a moment. And let's start with 2008. Because we know that 2000 to 2008 had explosive exponential growth because we went from zero to almost $14 billion in market cap across these five companies. So here we were in 2008, just a year after the NetSuite IPO and a few years after the Salesforce IPO in 2004, and we were feeling pretty good about the $14 billion in market cap that had been created. But then let's put that in perspective and let's roll forward seven years ahead to 2015 where we take that 14 billion of market cap and we play it forward to 20 billion and then 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100, 110, 114 billion dollars in market cap created. Over that seven year period, an 8x increase in combined market cap of those top five companies. Now let's move that forward again to present day, 2020. You take the top five companies again that starting point of $115 billion in market cap, and you go to 150 billion, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, and 16 billion dollars of total market cap among just these five companies. Another 4X growth, which in its totality is over 40X over that 12 year period. That's the power of the cloud model that's building. And that's just the five companies. So what if we could pull up a little bit and think about all of the companies in the public landscape. And do even better, what if we could get the entire history of the entire cloud industry in one chart? So we're gonna to attempt to do that, and we're gonna start with 2000. And this one's easy, because we know there was zero. There was not a public cloud company anywhere in the world. And it really took two years until you had a few companies like Ultimate Software that were transitioning from legacy on-prem to cloud, and they started to emerge with $29 million of total revenue as the first IPO. And then in 2004, you had Salesforce and Concur go public. You had Blackbaud, 
And then 2007, the bubbles grow as the market cap goes up, and then boom, 2008, the bubbles shrink because market caps collapsed, but the numbers kept moving right. These businesses were increasing revenue, they were moving up in free cash flow margin, more efficient, more powerful businesses, and the bubbles get bigger because the market caps are growing. And you see increasing as these start to take over the chart, so much so that the whole picture is filled with beautiful blue bubbles as the cloud takes over. And that's the world we're in today. That's the public cloud ecosystem. And that's the power of the 53 public cloud companies that are representing this entire movement on the public side. Now, going back several years to 2011, we actually created an index to track this in a very tangible way. And then several years ago, we worked with NASDAQ to create what was the BVP NASDAQ Emerging Cloud Index. And last year, we worked with Wisdom Tree to turn that into an ETF in the Wisdom Tree Cloud Index. And so for the thrill seekers at home that are following the markets and financial volatility, you can actually check this on your phone now under M Cloud or W Cloud and see real-time quotes of what's happening in this industry. And this is what it looks like in terms of the cloud index. And in 2015, in our very first day of the cloud report, we made a bold prediction. In front of you then, we said a half trillion dollars of market cap is possible. And then we predicted by 2020, by this year, we would cross a half billion dollars in total market cap for the cloud industry among those 53 companies. We were wrong. In fact, we were wrong by two years. The industry grew at over 35% CAGR and hit that mark, passing the half trillion dollar milestone in 2018. And so when we stood before you last year, on February 5th of 2019, we were at almost a $700 billion market cap in this industry, and we predicted another major milestone. We predicted that we would cross the $1 trillion mark within the coming years. And in a bizarre combination of fate and good fortune, exactly one year later, on February 5th, 2000, we were happily wrong again. The industry crossed that $1 trillion milestone for the first time, exactly one year from when we made that prediction. And so we, as the partners of Bessemer Venture Partners, one of the most bullish people on the entire cloud ecosystem and the largest investor in the cloud space, still underestimated the power of this movement that's building. And we think of this now in terms of market cap, and indeed market cap is a major indicator, but really what it's reflecting is the power of the model underneath. And it's the revenue and free cash flow of these businesses um, and you should really include the cloud percentages of the Amazon business and the Google business that are driving this. And so let's also reflect on two milestones that the industry crossed with that group included. And let's look at revenue of SaaS businesses. Over the last year, the $100 billion revenue milestone has been crossed on the top layer of the stack on the application side in SaaS. And equally impressively, a parallel milestone in the infrastructure space. In the infrastructure as a service arena, $100 billion of revenue collectively has been shown across these vendors. And if you look at just Amazon alone, $40 billion in annual run rate, 35% growth rate at that scale, and even more shockingly, almost 30% operating income. That means over $10 billion of profit is coming out of Amazon Web Services today and Microsoft, Azure, and the others are actually gaining share in many markets. But those stats, as mind-boggling as they are, pale to one number, 94. 94% is the number of enterprises using cloud solutions today. We are truly living in this cloud-first world. And the image that comes to mind for me is like Muhammad Ali standing over Sonny Liston with that fist clenched, and it's like that complete knockout blow. And that's what's happened. Cloud has just knocked out software and the industry. And so this notion that software is eating the world, which was timely and provocative, but is outdated now and was only half true. Because in fact, it is cloud that is eating software. And it takes a while to compound, and you saw those early years as it was building. But today, we're over the 30% mark. And as you roll forward, you see it building where in the very near future, we are going to cross the majority threshold, where over 50% of the entire software industry is going to be cloud. And so you can think of this more as a pie chart, where you see cloud on one side, 
in the very near future going to be over 50%. And you see in the dark gray here, software overall. And in 2025 or sooner, cloud will become the majority. And then you roll that forward, and it's this awesome Pac-Man-like effect where cloud is taking over and consuming software. That's the era we're in today. And so as exciting as that is, one natural question you may all be asking yourselves is, is that actually good or bad for me though? Because I missed the first 20 years in some form and I really want to build the business of the future. And so if you think of the most narrow definition of cloud and strip out some of that and use a Gartner number, the 172 billion for market size, and you think of software, which is a little under a half trillion, there's a double plus ahead. But most of you out there want to more than double your business. And so what's the potential for you and are there limits? The exciting part here is we don't think so. And we think that the potential is even greater in the years ahead. And here's why. So we know that cloud's consuming software, that game's over. Um, and that half trillion dollar market is absolutely addressable and will be consumed. But more and more of the $3.7 trillion economy is driven by cloud software. And this is digitization of healthcare. This is uh, software and connectivity in automobiles. This is the um, communication stack becoming an on-demand world. Cloud software is driving technology. And excitingly, technology is driving the global economy. And so in many worlds, it's the $88 trillion economy that is actually addressable by all of you as entrepreneurs and by us as investors. And so when you think about how to go after it, there's even now a playbook. And years ago, we worked with our entrepreneurs in the very first Bessemer 10 Laws of Cloud Computing. And Elliot's going to walk you through the update and how that's even more relevant today. Thank you, Byron. As Byron mentioned, back in 2008, Bessemer Venture Partners established the very first 10 Laws of Cloud Computing Report. And this established many of the best practices for not only how to operate, but then scale world-class cloud computing companies. But a lot has changed over the time. Even this year, we introduced a new bonus law called Playing the Public Playbook. And what this does is give companies a playbook for how to go public successfully. And as part of our 20-year look back, we wanted to highlight some of the laws historically that have driven the most impact in the market and the ones that we think are going to drive innovation going forward. First, in the cloud economy, scale is what matters. Second, how do you master the sales and marketing learning curve? And lastly, how do you use culture and values to set the tone at the top? Let's dive in. So Toby at Shopify defined scale really uniquely, two ways. One, of course, you've got to dominate the market. You've got to have the overwhelming majority of the market share, but you and your company and your products have to set the pace of innovation, not only in your industry, but for your competitors. If you take video conferencing, for example, it's pretty obvious to everyone that Zoom is the cloud giant that exists today. They've amassed almost 65% of market share, leaving the balance to be fought over for the number two and number three player. On the innovation side, they've in introduced things like call recording, the Zoom room, and some really tight integrations with the Microsoft Office suite that make all of it feel seamless. Now, you're probably sitting there thinking, Elliot, why am I so obsessed with scale? You know, I'm a 1 million ARR company. I've got my first set of paying customers. I can't even think about $100 million of, of top line. Now, different from 1999, for example, with Cornerstone On Demand, it took them almost 13 years to achieve that type of revenue scale and cross the 100 million ARR marker. Different from today's cloud giants, companies like Slack, HashiCorp, Twilio, many of those companies actually go from 1 million to 100 million of ARR, many times less than five years. And that's really important for you to think about. Now, something that we've seen with many of our biggest cloud successes is something at Bessemer that we call the second act. In other words, what's that next thing on your product roadmap or your product innovation that's going to drive scale in the future? Shopify, for example. In 2011, they launched their initial product. Fast forward to 2013, and they had eclipsed 50 million of ARR and started to launch their second act in the form of payments. 18 months forward, they had tripled their top line revenue to 150 million of ARR. And in, only in 2015, Shopify went public, where their second act payments again represented almost 50% of top line growth. 
Now, there's a bunch of different ways to launch your second act. If you think about Toast in the restaurant management space, they started with their core product, which was the point of sale terminal, and then they launched their second act in the form of Toast Capital and Toast Payroll. Twilio, for example, they started in voice, video, and chat as their core product offering. And uniquely, as one of their many second acts, they acquired a company in Syngrid and then brought their second act in the form of email to the market. And lastly, in the infrastructure space, a company like HashiCorp, they've been multi-product for a very, very long time. And then they launched their second act in the form of provisioning and networking. So the takeaway here is there's many ways to launch your second act. You can do it organically, or you can do it by partnering with a company, or even acquiring them. The next law is law number three, mastering the sales and marketing learning curve. This is all about your go-to-market organization's ability to learn fast, fail fast, and once you figure out things are working a little bit, scaling as fast as possible. So let's dive in. This is the first phase. Really important to most startups. As a founder, you've got a product that's finally working, some paying customers. You can take off one of your many hats as the head of sales and bring in that first batch of field sales reps. As a general rule of thumb, you don't even want to think about going to the next phase until all of those folks are covering their fully burned cost. Now we've made it to the second phase. This is where you can start to think about go-to-market more holistically. For pipeline generation, you're thinking about marketing demand gen, business development reps, and for the field, you're thinking about sales development reps, and then you're gonna to start to layer on those new account executives and put them out into the field. And now we've made it to the execution phase. This is where it gets really, really fun. You know what quota should look like, you know what ramp time looks like, and the category or the characteristic of sales rep you're looking for, they're a bit more coin operated. They just need some sales collateral, a new territory, and a target list to go after. And as a philosophy, as you're traversing the sales and marketing learning curve, you always think about nailing it before you scale it. And as you mature, you want to nail it and scale it again. And lastly, we get to my favorite law, setting the tone at the top. This is all about how do you leverage culture and values to differentiate yourself in the market. At Bessemer, we think about this in a few creative ways. First, for founders and CEOs, you really want to lay out what your mission and vision is. This is all about what does your company do? Why does it exist? And where is it going? Next, put pen to paper and really think about what are your core values? And what type of culture do you want to create inside of your company? Next, you want to think about employee engagement metrics that matter to you. You want to report them, track them, and this will help you keep your finger on the pulse about how things are going inside of your company. And then lastly, 360 feedback surveys, these are key. There's no time that's too early for you to start rolling these out. And luckily, there's some great software tools that can help you tackle all of these problems. For example, CultureAmp and Glint, great software tools that many of our best cloud companies use every day. And lastly, I want to take a minute to talk about diversity and inclusion. This is pretty important to me. I don't technically look like your average venture capitalist. And I want to give a special shout out to Edith, Edith Harbaugh, founder and CEO of LaunchDarkly. They've really found a special way to weave in DNI initiatives into their company's code of conduct. They talk about it, they live it every day, and it's even featured on their public facing website. And lastly, at Bessemer, we care a lot about firm wide initiatives. This gives your company an opportunity to amplify its impact, not just in the technology sector that you operate in, but in the broader community. And for that, I'm going to bring Byron up to talk about Pledge 1%. All right, well, before you leave, uh, let me also begin by saying this applies to investors as well. And uh, my partner here's Twitter handle for years has been the Values VC. You live culture and breathe it every day. And that's an important part of what we try to espouse at Bessemer is this connectivity with our portfolio companies and their values and culture through to our firm. And one of the many things I love about working with you. And Pledge 1% is one of the ways that we do it as a firm and how we work with our portfolio. The vast majority of our top portfolio companies have all taken some form of this pledge, which is some combination of equity, time, and software contributing to nonprofits, their community, and really trying to have an impact beyond just their immediate uh, commercial goals. Now, this includes the Pinterest of the world, Twilio, um, DocuSign, SendGrid, Box, uh, and many, many more that collectively have raised hundreds of millions of dollars to have direct community and social impact as part of their Pledge 1% initiatives. Now, this is a critical part of law number nine. And as Elliot showed you, when you combine it with the other laws, you essentially now have a playbook to how to go out and build your great cloud business. 
But many of you may be sitting there saying, where should I target my guns? Where should I spend my energy in this massive cloud economy? And this is what leads us to my favorite section of each State of the Cloud report, which is the predictions piece. Here we're going to talk you through the, the mega trends and the subcategories within cloud computing that we think offer the most opportunity for entrepreneurs, founders, and investors in the years ahead. We're going to start off with law number one, which is timely in this uh, health conscious, uh, geopolitically unstable, financially volatile times, which is a work from home movement. And it's this idea that the future of work will be remote and distributed. This is a trend that we've been active in for many quarters, and we believe it's just getting started in terms of the impact for businesses of most types. Increasingly, as you talk about the world's best businesses wanting to compete with a distributed, high-performing, and increasingly diverse labor force, they need to pull these people in from wherever in the world they happen to be. And so you're going to see management tools, cultural tools, onboarding and training, knowledge sharing, HR and payroll tools that help enable this. And we want to meet those businesses, and increasingly our companies are looking to deploy them across their own uh, business and foundation as well. The next prediction is all about privacy. Now, if you think about companies in the technology space over the last 30 years, they've done one thing really well, and that's collect all of our data. But what they haven't done really well is protect any of it. So at Bessemer, we're really excited about meeting with companies that are going after that very problem. And we like to bifurcate between the enterprise solutions and the consumer solutions. So as a subcategory, I'll highlight two. In the data inventory and scanning space, companies like Big ID are really leading the charge. And then in the consumer space, companies like Dashlane are doing a lot to protect all of the data that me, you, and your families care about. Now, before I jump to prediction number three, let me set the backdrop here a little bit, which is to say that we all know cloud began in Silicon Valley and San Francisco. And California's had a great run driving this initiative. And yet, many of our most successful cloud companies have been born in other geographies. The Shopify's and Eloqua's in Canada, or Cornerstone On Demand and Service Titan and Procore in Southern California, uh, SendGrid in Boulder, Boulder, Colorado, and Wix in Israel. We believe it's time for Western Europe and China and Asia, and hopefully even Latin America and Africa to start driving this revolution as well. We are looking across the globe for the world's best entrepreneurs, ideas, and businesses to back the cloud innovation globally. The next prediction is all about looking at the trend where B2B transactions are going from offline to online in their marketplace. So look, over the last 10, 15 years, a lot of venture capitalists and tech entrepreneurs alike have focused on B2C marketplaces, whether it's companies like Uber or Amazon or Shopify. It makes sense. We use them every day. But if you look at some of the companies that are doing a lot of the transformation in this space, what you might not know is they're tackling a $100 trillion market opportunity. So from freight to flowers or from cars to cannabis, we're really excited about this trend and we're looking forward to meeting more companies in the future. Prediction five, the API economy is upon us. You see it with Twilio and Amazon Web Services on the public side breaking out their numbers, or with Plaid and the $5 billion acquisition by Visa, or you hear it about Stripe and what's happening under the covers on the private side with their $35 billion plus valuation. But it's happening in almost every sector and slice of the economy, whether it's uh, set and grid and email, Auth0 and identity, cloudinary and content and media, what's happening with Shippo and shipping or payroll with Checker. We believe that most major categories are going to have a cloud giant with an API front end to expose them and drive this next level of the cloud evolution. And our final prediction is focused on enterprise automation at scale. So if you think about how much data has been created and captured inside of the enterprise over the last decade or two, there's also been a proliferation of software tools that we use every day inside of the enterprise. So at Bessemer, we're really excited about the role that automation is going to play in terms of bringing it all together. So companies like Zapier and Unito, they've done a great job of automatically tying data from one software tool and connecting it to another. If we look back at robotic process automation, for example, it's been kind of the, the trend-setting uh, category in enterprise automation at scale. Companies like Automation Anywhere, UiPath have really blazed the trail thus far. But there's two emerging categories that we're equally excited about. 
First, the low-code, no-code application movement, being, being led by companies like Uncork and Instabase, and an even newer category, software-defined management, being championed by a New York City-based company called Hyperscience. And there it's all about how do you automate enterprise workflows from beginning to end, soup to nuts. So in aggregate, these six predictions represent the most exciting areas that Bessemer Venture Partners is focused in the cloud into 2020. So one of the really fun things about the last 20 years is the community that's emerged in cloud and the best practices and knowledge sharing that people are starting to bring together so that you're not alone. You don't need to figure this all out for the first time as people did 20 years ago. And what we've tried to do at bvp.com slash cloud is pull that together for you. So not only is this presentation in its entirety available to download, but each of the prior year's State of the Cloud reports are there. And for the first time ever, we've got an appendix section, which is our attempt to pull together wonderful third-party reports and research pieces, many of which were the underpinnings of our data and the conclusions in our report, to share those out with you as well. And a new piece of content is a podcast, Cloud Giants, where we interview many of these top public cloud CEOs on their specific journey from your side, the founding and early days of business, all the way through to their IPO and beyond. And so you can get those resources online now at bvp.com slash cloud and collectively be part of what is now this cloud first era. And so when you step back and think about what's ahead, we'd be remiss if we didn't leave you with an actual forecast. And I'm very thrilled to share that we believe at Bessemer Venture Partners that the future is indeed cloud. Mm -hmm.